But before I share my slides, I'll just start with an introduction, if, if I may. Thank, Thank you so you. much, first of all, for having me, Fiona. It's, uh, it's really a great honor. And I, I'm, you know, I'm very sad that I'm not there up in Cambridge. I hope to, to do that some other time. You're welcome. Um, time. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm actually a computer scientist by training, studied in Berlin at the Technical University of Berlin. And I, straight after my MSc, I went to, to London and did my PhD at UCL and working in image analysis already in medical imaging. Um, little bits of and bobs more like image analysis in the traditional sense. Um, did then a string of postdocs. I went to University Medical Center Utrecht. So that was very nice. It was like a, um, it's the Image Sciences Institute. So they're embedded within the radiology department, but they are computer scientists, physicists, and so on. So it was very close working with clinician close interactions. And in, in fact, afterwards I went to King's um, to, to the then computational imaging group with Dave Hawkes, um, where uh, the, again, I was embedded at Guy's Hospital. So that was really good being really, you know, closely interacting with clinicians um, every day. And you probably know Reza Razavi, I met him there when he did his PhD and I did a postdoc. So it was, uh, we've got a long history there. And then I closed a bit of a circle. I went to UCL again. We formed the Center of Medical Image Computing at UCL, which was then the, the largest medical image analysis group, I think, in Europe, I would say. So it was really, we were like 100 people all of a sudden. Um, and then I got my first academic appointment at Oxford at the, the new Institute of Biomedical Engineering. So I worked there with uh, Mike Brady, Alison Noble and, and so on. But again, very closely with radiology, with Fergus Gleason, for example. So um, that, that was really great. We're just on the same campus on the same side. For me, this kind of interdisciplinary um, environment was always great. And then I closed another circle. I, I became professor in Oxford, uh, but I immediately got a call from London because I had been commuting from London to Oxford for eight years uh, with my silly Brompton bike on the train. And so I put an end to that commuting nonsense and decided to actually go back to King's. Um, and then King's had hugely grown by that time. They were the only biomedical engineering department within within again the medical school. So that was again, like having close colleagues in biomedical engineering who were pediatric cardiologists and so forth, which was really, really quite amazing. And uh, then, I don't know, a couple of years back, I got a call from Germany, which was uh, exciting as well. And uh, I got um, an appointment at Helmholtz um, uh, Center Munich, uh, which is part of the Helmholtz Association, which is not very well known outside of Germany, but it's the largest research organization in Germany, if not in Europe, in terms of funding. They're, they're enormous. Uh, I mean, they also do uh, aeronautical space space stuff and so on. So, but but the, the the cancer center in Heidelberg is part of it, and in Munich we are working on environmental health. So it's really big interesting and with the college it's a big mri center as well that's how that's I think the ulich center is part of it as well exactly high field um, mri and um and tu munich so i'm at a uh, professor at um, computer science in tu munich but i didn't let like, ever go of the uk it's been up and spent half my life so i'm i'm still at king's college part-time one day a week nominally but usually it's, i do it in little bursts and, and uh, travel when there's no quarantine and all these things but you know apparently COVID has stopped, so we can just travel without masks and BA next week. So all will be good. <laughs> <laughs> so COVID, there's lots of COVID about. That's weird. <laughs> Let's not get into this. But yeah, I've, I've been so I've been working on computation imaging, uh, getting closer and closer to the image acquisition, which I thought might be interesting for radiologists among the folks and MR physicists. But please forgive me, I'm not a radiologist. I'm not an MR physicist. I'm a computer scientist. So I will make lots of mistakes on the road. So probably start That's sharing cool. my Look screen. forward to your lecture. Thank you so much. <laughs> so I start sharing my screen. So you see all my, my affiliations and they get longer and longer on every paper. But basically, that's me. And I was asked by Fiona to um, talk about the future of AI and radiology. So just at least my personal perspective on that. So I'll try to, to give it a shot. So um, 
we start with AI and medicine and, and you've following, been following the press. This is four years ago, an article, AI in the machine, uh, AI in medicine, rise of the machine. It's kind of like, a, so it sounds a bit like a, from a Terminator movie um, and the march of the machines in the economist, you see from Metropolis, the German movie from the 1920s, uh, the robot appearing and it becomes a bit almost um, aggressive like AI versus MD, whether, you know, as if there's like a battle starting and uh, nature also had this feature on AI for healthcare. So there was clearly something going on. Uh, here's an article from the MIT Technology Review. Um, that's a recent one. So um, that was only, that only appeared last summer and then after uh, COVID started and still pestering us, of course. And it was a quite sobering article, which actually said there are hundreds of AI tools which have been built to catch COVID, but none of them helped, which is quite, you know, frustrating really, because we've been building lots of tools to segment lungs and quantify disease and so on automatically, but we couldn't very quickly turn them around to actually help in this pandemic. So it was a sobering thought. So AI upfront essay is not the solution to everything. Um, but interestingly, in radiology, it's it's been a very popular um, field to apply AI and outside of computer vision, self-driving cars and all these other things, of course. But um, if you look at what uh, medical devices and algorithms have been approved by the FDA, this was last autumn and since then has slightly increased. Um, half of them basically focus on radiology. So if you look at the list, this, this paper actually maintains an active list. I think the, the number of, of radiology and AI um, FDA approved devices or algorithms have has risen about to 40 something. And it's rising every day. It's actually, it's, it's, it's a natural marriage, I would say, because AI and imaging just works really well. Um, but of course there was a lot of, um, you know, noise in the community. Jeffrey Hinton, um, a, a British um, AI researcher who's based in Canada and he's kind of the godfather of deep learning, said in 2017 they should stop training radiologists now. So I'm putting this out very controversially to you as, as a radiologist. And, and um, so it, it was taken slightly out of context. Now I will come back to that statement at the end, but you know, MIT Technology Review also continued its assault of AI on radiologists and, and that was not helpful. We have to work together on this. We can't just be, be rivals. So, but, you know, facing this, AI, uh, radiology has these different, different, different pictures. And I've stolen that picture from the Imperial College website. And just in case you've seen it already, I'm quite honest about it. But you've got this, this multitude of images with contrast, different diseases, um, 2D, 3D, 4D, and so on. So there's a huge challenge. And as a radiologist, you, you're probably feeling quite overwhelmed sometimes. It's, it's, a, it's a long list you have to go through, often at the end of the day when you're very tired. And of course, you could use some help. And this is where I, I, AI might actually be of some benefit. So let's, let's define a little bit what, what AI is. Artificial intelligence is defined as the simulation of human intelligence, if there is any, um, of these processes by machines, especially by computer systems. And But what we normally mean by that is actually machine learning, which also is not a very nice word. Machines cannot learn. I mean, they don't have a, a conscience, but it's basically describing computer algorithms that can be trained from data directly when it's really too hard to, to specify the task and to do it manually. So it's basically a, a good way of delegating the work to, to a computer program. But what we actually now mostly do is deep learning. It's, it's a very cool, cool world which comes from education, shallow learning versus deep learning and classical machine learning is now often also called shallow learning because it doesn't use these deep, deep layers. Um, but basically what, what happens if you look at this historically, so basically deep learning is a subset of machine learning, machine learning is a subset of AI. But AI goes back to Alan Turing in the 1950s thinking about intelligent systems, um, the invention of, of computers and programs. Um, and then machine learning really became quite successful in the 1980s onwards and begins, began to flourish then. Deep learning actually has its roots around the same time. When I studied in the 1990s, I studied 
you know, neural networks and all these things, but we're just not there yet because we didn't have the GPUs and the big databases and that's on. We're still very modest what we did, but the techniques have not changed that much actually. But it began really to lift up in the 2010s. Um, this is when we all started, you know, changing our gear a little bit and, and jumped on that bandwagon because it was just really, really popular. But I mentioned all these health um, warnings before. So in radiology, it's actually not a new concept because CAT system, computer-aided diagnosis system, have been around, you know, for a long time, actually. And there the purpose was always to help improve the diagnostic accuracy and the consistency of the radiologists who interpreted the images. And there are two, two types. There's CAT-E, computer-aided detection, which marks just area, highlights areas in the images which might be abnormal. And that's kind of to, to attract the radiologist's attention to those, those areas in case they have overlooked it to reduce the risk of missing pathologies of interest. I mean, the main problem with these methods is that they highlight a lot of other areas. So you get a lot of um, false positives as well. So that's, that's usually where a lot of these methods still focus on false positive direct, um, a reduction as well. And then there's CAD-X, which is a bit higher level, which actually tries to do something more. It helps the practitioner to assess and classify pathology. So actually tries to see things which are not so easily seen, but, but just trying to squeeze more uh, out of those images than is apparent to the human eye. But CAT is really an early version of AI in medicine and radiology. And in that way has been around for over 40 years, believe it or not. So we've been using AI without kind of may fully realizing it, but, but it comes with its own pitfalls as well. And this is just a, an early paper from 1999, which already raised some issues that there might be. And of course, a lot of you, especially if we're working in um, oncological imaging, uh, might be aware of radiomics. It's also, it has been really, really um, topical at the beginning of this um, millennium, I would say. Um, is still being used quite widely. And it's based on the assumption that you've got medical images that contain lots of dense information on disease processes and you can't see them so easily just with your, with your naked eye. Um, it, it, it does not mean that uh, you, this, these methods automate the diagnostic process, but they just provide basically these additional data to the practitioner. And you do this dedicated workflow, you, you put the uh, patient through an exam or through multiple imaging exams, uh, so it um, could be multimodal imaging, you then extract some structures of interest, run some radiomics features, and where you just extract some very simple features like just the, the size, the volume, the elongation, the shape, is it speculated or smooth? Um, just intensity distributions, and then maybe some higher level ones where you look at the texture, the variation of intensities, is it homogeneous um, or is it uh, hugely varied? Um, and then some extra filters, which, which are just mathematical um, ways of, of um, extracting more, more information from images. Let's then put some traditional data analysis tools, some classification methods, which are really shallow machine learning if you want, and then this is added into some decision support system. So I think it's mostly used in oncology, and it also goes by the name of texture analysis. Um, so the problem with these approaches, they've been quite successful, and they work on reasonably low numbers of data, so tens or hundreds rather than thousands or tens of thousands of data sets. But there is a lack of image quality there. So it's the, the you know that you know there are very few really quantitative imaging methods, and even those have problems. Um, and there's also a lack of standardization, and how you extract those features will then be affected by. Um, say intensity gradings um, uh, of, of the images. So the results are not well reproducible. And so I think their main purpose is some retrospective use, trying to see whether they get more out of your study data. So the prospective use is, is a little bit more limited, but they, of course, they have been used. Um, and there are limitations to that. So this was a paper again from uh, 2017, where where it was quite clearly remarked that CAD uh, was was used for a while on digitalized mammograms as early 
with, with FDA approval as early as 1998. But to date, no randomized trials have been performed to assess uh, the effect of the use of CAT on breast cancer mortality. There was this meta-analysis which showed just a small statistically insignificant increase in cancer detection. But again, there was a higher recall rate associated and there were more false positives going with that. So I think this is where we are still working on. We still need to bring these methods up there and really prove that they're working and it hasn't been proven, for example, for these CAT systems. Um, and that's really important to note. So is there a better way? I've mentioned deep learning, of course, this is the, the hip topic we're all working on. So this is a class of machine learning, which is, is different to radiomics because it uses multiple layers that are trained and that can then progressively extract higher level features directly from the raw input. So um, you just push in through your database of images to this neural network. As long as it's more than two layers, it's called a deep neural network and then it becomes only deep learning. And then there's some output and the output could be just something like a classification, like benign or malignant or cancer or not, or cardiovascular disease present or not, but it, it, it could be something much more graded like a multitask uh, staging uh, system, for example. But the, the really nice thing about deep learning is it learns these features directly from the data. So it, it does not require any input. You have to still decide how many layers you use, how many connections you use, how you present the data, how you um, uh, select the data in, in terms of training and validation sets and so on. But basically it's fully data driven. So it actually learns the image uh, characteristics directly. So it should be um, uh, really automatically task and imaging domain specific. So you don't need any further fine tuning. You don't need any hand crafting or, or manual intervention. It also comes with drawbacks because if you train it on one imaging modality, you can't directly use it on another imaging modality. Or if you train on one scanner system, you can't directly use it on the next scanner system. You have to do something in between, but people are very actively working on that to make them more generalizable. That's very neat because it actually really learns how, say, an MR image of the heart looks like without you actually telling it directly. You, there, are, there are different ways you can do it, a bit more guided, of course. But what it needs, it needs really large, well-curated and preferably annotated image databases for training. So it, 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 it needs that initial input. And this is where the expert knowledge of radiologists also comes in, because the annotations is what we're chasing our radiologists up on. So we need you know, somebody to label it, at least some soft label of, of some sort, some soft annotation. Otherwise, we can't train because you don't know what you have to train against. So that's a drawback, but it also means that there's work to do and we should see it as a positive challenge. So in radiology, you see like, you know, seen a um, cardiac MRI, we've got this, this really nice, nice problem of having um, patients of different um, anatomy, different physiology and so on. And we want to extract some clinically meaningful information at the end of the day. Now these neural networks, we just basically have been taking them straight from the computer vision community. I mean, they inventing the great stuff and we're just stealing it and trying to make it work on something more exciting than planes and cats and, and um, tennis rackets. But we, we actually um, use the same methodology. So here, for example, we, we put an image through for denoising. Now we just have a poor quality image. We want to get a nice quality image. We can do that in a guiding fashion by presenting the network lots of pairs of good and bad, uh, like low noise and high noise containing images. And it learns to go from one space to the other automatically. Or we can just decide as an image of good quality or not by presenting the, the network lots of examples of good and bad quality images labeled as such and it will just flag them up if they're of poor quality. You can also do it as a regression task. That means you can give it a grading it's like excellent quality, good quality or poor quality. So you can actually have a multi-layered multi output and can threshold on that. And then, of course, you want to do measurements. You want to look at um, ejection fraction, myocardial uh, thickening, and other things. So you can do segmentations and then extract the measures quite automatically. And this is this is actually where 
deep learning has been almost most successful in. I think some people even think we've solved the segmentation problem. Uh, it's, but, but I'll show you when, when it actually doesn't work and what we can do about it in this talk. So in medical imaging, we typically fall into one of the following groups. We either acquire the images, those would be more the, the image physicists with the, with the radiographers. So we generate raw data using some imaging sensor like an MRI scanner. We then reconstruct the images if need be. So not for ultrasound, but, but, um, but uh, for, for MRI and PET and CT this is where computers came in handy. Um, so that transforms the raw sensor data into an image suitable for viewing. And then there's this what people call post-processing, I would call like image computing. This is when you do the basic image operations. You filter out uh, images which you haven't filtered out already during the construction. You filter out things afterwards, you segment the images and so on. Then are the bit more higher level um, uh, approaches where you analyze the images so you can construct models of uh, healthy anatomy versus pathology. And um, that's already low level machine learning actually. If you want to detect and classify disease, and again, this, this goes into machine learning and has been going into that direction for the past 30, 40 years already. And then there's the Im image interpretation by clinicians and radiologists in particular. So this is a, usually quite a serial process and um, AI is increasingly applied within, of, within each of these groups, which is quite nice. Um, but we actually have been working ourselves backwards along that, that imaging pipeline. So we started almost with the complex task, the models, but now we go more into, more into thinking about how can AI approve the acquisition of images even. And the really interesting thing is that if you start thinking about how can AI work across these, these um, different um, stages of the imaging pipeline. So I call it AI-enabled imaging, and um, machine learning in medical imaging has these challenges. We've got sometimes poor quality data because there are artifacts uh, associated with the scanning system or associated with the patient physiology and when the motion of the patient is aligned the scanner. Um, there's this lack of availability of these nice, large, curated and annotated data sets. Um, clinical data is much more varied than this nice training data, which we use usually from healthy subjects. Um, we have differences across different scanning systems, and there's something which is called the domain shift, even within, you know, just between scanning systems of the same manufacturer at the same field strength, for example, you still have some, some issues there. And of course, the general problem, and I'm not touching on that here, um, is the black box approach. It's this lack of interpretability. You're actually presenting uh, like a feta complete to the radiologists and tell them, you know, everything's fine. I've trained a network, that's the output. And you can't really look inside of that, that network very easily. And that's where people are also now looking at because for acceptance, to gain clinical acceptance, um, and acceptance by the patients eventually as well, you, you need to work a bit more on that. So in this talk, I will talk mainly about uh, how we can think about using machine learning along the imaging pipeline from acquisition to interpretation in some modular and integrated fashion, um, and even what we call end-to-end, -end, really going from raw data eventually going to some final results. And I use cardiac imaging, I will focus here on um, quality control for cardiac MRI and in the context also for improving imagery construction and segmentation, a bit analysis. And I, I don't think I've got time to go into a domain shift today. So cardiac MRI has lots of quality issues. It's actually a great problem to study because you've got uh, physiological motion, um, you've got uh, respiratory motion, you've got patient motion. Uh, and so, so many different diseases. So it's, it's actually, it has all the challenges, all these different protocols, these different views, and, and you want to actually find a one-stop shop solution for that, which uh, of course is not possible, but we, we can start helping with automating some of the processes. Image quality here is based, of course, on first of all, the underlying MR physics, the block equations and the, the scanner system and the, the gradients and so on. Um, there's always this trade off between signal to noise. So you have to usually um, look at spatial versus temporal resolution. You have the acquisition time uh, to, to worry about. There's only a certain time window where you can scan patients in, and then you have to be very efficient with your protocols. 
and you've got this patient physiology, as I mentioned. Um, with respiration, you've got um, the extra problem, of course, you, you need consistent breath holds and these are cardiac patients um, who are slightly out of breath often so that this is where they fail and, and this is where you have to help help with maybe some better tools and other patient motion of course so that leads to images being discarded uh, or, or annotations impacted and corrupted and and you need to recall patients sometimes which means um, it's not only affecting the hospital workflow but could delay vital diagnosis. So that's, that's also to be avoided. So ideally you would want to, while scanning the patient, know whether the, the scan is good enough so you can just repeat it if need be. So as I mentioned, for, for deep learning methods, you need really nice quality data, nice annotations, large and well curated databases. And of course in the UK, we're world leading on that <laughs> um, because you've got these We've got this wonderful database, the UK Biobank, which has invited back 100,000 original volunteers for scanning. And there's, it's been on the news just uh, a few days ago from the group in Oxford that they found um, brain volume change in certain areas associated with your sense of smell in, in uh, people who had COVID. So they had the before after images, which is an absolute um, amazing finding. And, and I'm sure there'll be many more things coming out of these, these kinds of studies, especially also cardiac imaging, I'm sure. But these are this is a nice curated database. It's very tightly controlled in terms of scan qualities, one scanner manufacturer, one field strength, one protocol, very high scan consistency. Um, and these are predominantly volunteers, but of course, some of them have uh, or gone or gone to develop uh, certain diseases. So, uh, but, but in a lower proportion than the general population, because volunteers tend to be more healthy than, than, than not. But you've got these wonderful images and it, it's a huge gold mine. And I think it's one of the best, best things that could have happened to research in the UK and worldwide, because of course other people can access this now too. So starting from this fantastic quality data, uh, how can we get to real patient data? Because there is, there is this shift and you can call this a domain shift already. Um, what we want to do is we want to assess whether a um, patient needs to be rescanned. So we want to check if good quality or not. We could also use AI maybe, you know, using similar um, thinking to actually extract all the good data from your hospital pack system and establish a really nice training database. I think that would be a, the most practical use of AI, in fact, that you actually use AI to build up these nice training databases and then keep going to, to build more um, exciting tools which you can use. You also want to kind of avoid patients having to be rescanned. So you could, because it might be also historical data you're looking at. You want to, you've got maybe a scan a year ago and you want to compare, but it's a poor, poor quality or different scanning system. So you want to actually do something about those images. And you also want to think about further downstream tasks. So what do you want to do with the data? You just want to visually inspect it. Do you need to measure a tumor? Do you need to calculate ejection fraction? All these things, you know, do you want to look at whether MCI is converted into Alzheimer's? Lots of different things you want to do. So, so these things have to be taken into account when you as you restore the data, actually. And then ultimately, I think that would be the real challenge is you want to know when is imaging good enough. You want to stop imaging when the quality is good enough for the purpose for which you acquire it. So for maybe for a quick triage, you would do, do it quicker than, than for some more detailed scans. So you want to have a bit more dynamic allocation of your scan time. So you could maybe rule out disease very quickly. And then for next patient where you find something, you want to be able to allocate more time. So and then people are starting to work on that, on improving hospital workflows in, in that fashion. So I've shown this before. You want to, you know, the easy thing is to classify images into good and bad quality. For that, you need annotations, just like a tick box almost when you scan this. This scan was bad, this scan was good, so you could actually detect it. And this is a bit similar to a classification task in computer vision where people are apparently interested to decide whether there's a dog or a cat in an image. So it's just a very simple classification task. And what uses this, what's called an encoder architecture. So basically you pass through this, these 
images, many, many images with a label to these layers of networks. You group them together, um, compress it into a, a bottleneck. So you have a very low dimensional space. And in that space, you actually run the classification on. So you basically remove almost very much individual variability, but just condense these images into, into what helps them to be classified, distinguished between good and bad quality in this case. Um, so we looked at one very simple uh, thing, um, incorrect scan planning. So we looked at um, how to plan a good four chamber view in cardiac MRI, and there you need to acquire this two chamber and the short axis view place an appropriate angle on the on the short axis and exclude the aorta and if all goes well you get a really nice um, four chamber view so again this is uk biobank data but even in uk biobank data we found some where this was not done correctly and if you don't do this correctly if you don't do the plan correctly you get off axis images and you get the left ventricular outflow track visible the lvrt and you have this fake five chamber look and that of course messes up with any, any further uh, downstream atrial analysis so that's a simple classification problem because you can pick out good and bad images. So with LVRT present or not, train networks, um, you know, there is some pre-processing there that you actually grab the, the heart out of the, the MR images with some automated either object detection approach or a template matching approach, um, whatever tools are available there create just lots of 2D slices of good uh, views or bad views, train a network and then get a classification out of that. So <laughs> we searched up and down UK Biobank. At the time, we had access to about 4,000 images, which was fast, huge. It was amazing. Um, uh, and we found 123 where the LVOT was present. I mean, I think that that percentage is probably a bit low. Um, so to have a balanced approach, we picked 123 good quality images as well. We did something which is called data augmentation. So we just create some synthetic versions of those images just to get more different orientation, translation, rotations, and so on, um, just to give a bit more, more jitter into the, the um, training data. Of course, these are temporal images. So senior images that we grabbed more temporal frames also incorrectly planned. So in the end, we had 615 images for each class, and we did some cross-validation just to sort of always left a different set of 10 out and, and average the results. And we did here, I'm just listing this, um, a lot of shallow machine learning methods. This was right at the beginning when we got into deep learning. Uh, Ilko Oxis, my postdoc then, now lecturer in, in Istanbul. Um, he went through all the traditional shallow machine learning methods and uh, also into the convolutional neural network, basically the, the classifier I've shown you approach uh, with or without data augmentation. And he managed to really boost the performance, get better accuracy, precision, and recall using the neural network approach on a comparatively modest modestly sized data set. So I was quite surprised at the power of this, but I think it's because it's still really nice image quality, even the wrongly planned images. Of course, I was curious and asked him to tell me what's going on inside the black box, look inside the network, tell me what's going on. And he showed me um, this an example, is an image with an LBOT present. This is a good quality image. And then you get something which is called the attention map. So it can look kind of shine a light backwards into your neural network and can actually see where the decision, you know, what happens, what filters are learned, what, what uh, feature maps are learned. And on that basis, the classification is, is kind of done. And you see on the left that where the LVOT is present, it shines up, lights up, whereas on the right, it's a bit more the separation of the heart chambers. That's only indicative, it's not a proof. It just shows that it's not that doing something very unreasonable inside. Of course, ideally, you would like to rescue the data for LVRT um, corrupted images. That's not possible because the scan was wrongly acquired in the first place at the wrong position. So we can't, you know, synthesize um, anatomy. Or if we did, it would be not quite, quite good. Um, but we can think of other problems. So if you've got a motion corrupted image, could we actually decorrupt it? Could we actually? Get cancel out the motion and get to the what would have been the original image. And of course, um, it's helpful then to understand where where these artifacts come from, these image artifacts. And you probably know this much better than me. 
but if you if you look at the left, the good quality image, you get a really nice, you know, crisp left. We see the papillary muscles and the myocardium and everything. And on the right, you, you've got not only poor contrast and different anatomy of a patient, but you also see um, like this temporal motion blur through the heart. And this is because something has been done wrong in the binning at the time of case space acquisition. So this is called ECG mistriggering, and this is of, of course more frequent for patients with arrhythmia and tachycardia and, and all these things because this is why they are patients. And, and this is just happening. Normally you would acquire frames in each case space, lines in case space. I'm showing here a Cartesian, just line by line um, case space. Um, you would do it over several breath holes and always you don't stop scanning, but you always go to the next um, part in the cardiac cycle to keep filling up the case space. And you do that over several breath holes and all those well. You just go back into the, the image domain doing the inverse Fourier transform and you get nice images. But of course, something can go wrong. These lines of case space could get mixed up over the temporal sequence and then you get these motion blurs. So this is quite nice because you can actually think, you know, if we, we can go this direction, you might be able to, to do something about it and, and decorrupt the images as well, because we know how the corruption started. So that's what we did. We, you know, but you can buy a bank, we've got loads and loads of really, really good quality data. Um, and of course, in the clinic, that's not the case. But what we could do, we can take this good quality data and make it look really bad. So we're very good at making images look really bad. So we can really degrade the quality very easily. Yeah, we can just start mixing up lines of case space over really um, several cardiac cycles in whatever you know um, amount we want, in whatever order we want. And we can actually have different gradings of images. Now we could just have very high quality, very poor quality, or we could have some things in between. And this is really helpful because that allows us to artificially generate these poor quality images, but paired with their good quality version. So we can go from one space to the other, which is when we can start thinking about going backwards as well. And that's really analogous to just data augmentation, computer vision, where people are wiggling around cats and, and dogs and so on, just to give more and more um, information to the network. So this is quite interesting. I mean, first we just did the straightforward thing, train networks to make them, you know, images look better. And that worked to some degree. We did it even from case space directly to the spatial domain because we said this is where the problem occurs. But then we thought, well, hold on. I mean, this is actually, if you if you think about how MR images are acquired, a lot of people are now working. You know, I mean, most scanners, especially with multiple cores, parallel imaging, you work on undersampling as well. So you want to acquire images quicker. And, and decide on some undersampling trajectory. So you only acquire a subset of case space lines when you, when you acquire the images. So you have an undersampled case space, which gives you poor image result, but you can train because you can train on fully sampled case space data, throwing away lines of case space. So you can actually learn how a good image would have looked like, um, do some data consistency there as well and get really nice high resolution reconstruction. So that's undersampling. Um, uh, using neural networks, actually, and then lots of different network architectures uh, you could think about. Um, so that's for accelerating images. Now here we've got the um, issue or the problem or the challenge that we have a fully sampled acquisition. So it's a completely blank image on the left, only that some lines are wrong. We know that because we've displaced them. Um, so we can actually think of that as a fully sampled acquisition, which gives us a fully sampled case space with some displaced lines. But then we can train a detection network, which tells us which lines are wrong and which ones aren't. And that's just a simple line by line classification. So we can actually train a neural network to detect those wrong lines, which actually come from different uh, part of the cardiac cycle and throw them away. And then we just transformed our motion reconstruction into an undersampled reconstruction because we removed the motion, we just left with an undersampled A space, which we then can just uh, um, get, uh, get out um, uh, a high resolution reconstruction, which is not only high resolution, but is also artifact corrected. So that was quite a, a nice idea from, from Ilka Oxus. Um, but then he said, well, actually, we don't only want images to look good. We want to do something with them, of course. And we have to think about what we want to do. For example, we want to segment the images. So uh, 
if you have a high quality image and we train our fantastic networks on segmentation labels that we need these for training these kinds of labels we get a good automated segmentation these days and this is when people say segmentation has been solved but you don't see in paper very often that they use poor quality images because this is then how the segmentation would look like if you just run it on that so that's that's not helpful that's why you don't see those results but this is more um you know more often happening in the in the clinic on real data that you actually have these motion blurs or other other artifacts you still need to want to have a um, segmentation on those so what what Ilka then did he put everything together so on the left hand side you still see our motion reconstruction network which con transformed this into an undersampling problem but then you can add a segmentation network and there are lots of nice networks out there the first really popular one in, uh, in medical imaging was called UNET just because it has the shape of a U. It's basically similar to what I've shown you before, this bottleneck network, you encode the data and then you decode it, you upsample again, you train against labels. The nice thing here is you can put in uh, 2D plus time uh, slices, so the scene is sequence in 2D. Um, and uh, that actually helps because you can actually um, connect then the network across time. So that's called a recurrent neural network, which means that there are some redundancy exploited between the, the thinner frames, but that actually helps in the performance. And then you can put everything together. And while it's reconstructing, it also learns how to segment. It learns both tasks together, not just as sequential tasks, but in, in one go. And you see some results, you see a severely corrupted, deliberately corrupt image. So we can show you the subtraction images, image of, so you see the, all the motion artifacts on the left and the poor quality segmentation. It's actually still pretty good given, given the data. I'm surprised something came out of that. And then on the right, you see it after motion correction and, um, and reconstruction. Uh, you still see some artifacts uh, in, in the residual image, but the much better segmentation. So we then looked at uh, the effect of if we do it sequentially, so we do the motion reconstruction and then a segmentation, or we do a joint training approach, reconstruction and segmentation. And we did this in a small, very small n equals one prospective study because we are curious. Um, and we did for this, for one healthy volunteer, we did deliberate ECG mistriggering during an acquisition. And we also acquired a good quality acquisition of the same healthy volunteer without the mistriggering, so just normal ECG triggering. And here are the examples just to illustrate it. On the left, you see the um, actual image with actual ECG mistriggering and the resulting segmentation, which does not look very good. Then on the second column, we did just the motion reconstruction and then separately a segmentation on that basis. So we actually see some improvement in the image. You see some reduction of the motion blur, especially if you look at the far right, where we have the corresponding good quality image and the resulting segmentation. And then the third column is actually our joint approach. So it's a joint motion reconstruction segmentation result, um, which I think almost looks better than the good quality image. It looks a bit more homogenous, as you can see, which is because it has been trained to also optimize for the segmentation, not just the reconstruction. So it had the segmentation training had an impact on the reconstruction quality. Whether it's good or bad is another question because you might lose other details because the focus of the network was on, on, on both optimizing the reconstruction and segmentation quality and not just the reconstruction quality. So it's, it's, it's done with a purpose. So reconstruction with, with a clinical goal in mind. But it actually has a potential to be some generic imagery constructor, which could be also useful for images which have not, um, uh, um, which don't have artifacts. And then we took it just one more step. I've got just three more slides or so, I think, um, where we go from image quality control to cardiac function. And this is a paper um, which we, um, uh, so I've lost, I lost my, my article reference in Jack in, in, uh, in, the, in the journal, where um, we, we just went through a whole protocol of things. So we created a whole pipeline and this work of, of Bam van Oysink and um, Esther Puyo from King's with my colleague Andy King, uh, where we just looked at acquired data, which was reconstructed. There was no correction or reconstruction optimization there, but we just did this image quality check 
So basically accept or reject. And then for, for the image with images which pass that first quality control step, we did a full cycle automatic segmentation using one of those um, neural network approaches. This is the work from the segmentation tool from Benjal Bai from Imperial College. And then we automatically computed parameters like particular volume curves. And then we did another quality control check, again, uh, like a classification accept or reject. This was actually using then shallow machine learning, where we looked at the profiles of the volume curves, the consistency of LV and RV, and the filling and rejection points. So only when they're passed that second quality control check, we would actually move on to calculate ventricular function. And this was compared uh, to um, uh, to um, a cardiologist assessment to, and, and we found that there was human level accuracy with respect to, to that observer. There was a really good agreement um, uh, for, for, the, um, for the LV and RV segmentation for the feature tracking. And uh, it was done on 700 cases, um, 500 healthy and 200 ischemic, ischemic uh, from a hospital. At, at, King, at St. Thomas's Hospital and with the high sensitivity and, and so on. So this was taken a bit closer to the clinic. And then the final question we, we asked and are currently working on is, um, could we stop scanning earlier? So going back to that first quality uh, check, do we need all that data, right? And the aim there is to accelerate the scanning process while still ensuring sufficient image quality. We moved back to UK Biobank for that, uh, 200 healthy subjects and 70 with cardiomyopathy, um, and did a retrospective basal on their sample. Now, this is Cartesian sample data, so this is um, a bit of a drawback, and of course, we don't have the original case space of that data anyway. We only can do an inverse Fourier transform. But we, we went through different quality checks. So we did different levels of radio undersampling, but then we again went through the quality check of reconstruction quality and the segmentation quality, and then the final uh, clinical function assessment. So this, what we found there on, the, on those data that we were able to reduce scanning time from 12 seconds to four seconds per slice, while still staying with a 5% error in everything. So that was quite nice. You just see the whole overview. You have from going from left to right, you've got the um, acquisition done by UK Biobank. We do the different levels of undersampled uh, reconstruction. You can train with the trained network, which is optimized for undersampled reconstruction already. Then we did a quality control check, just saying good or bad quality, segmentation on the full cardiac cycle. Then the, the second check on the, on the segmentation quality, um, and only if it passes, then it goes into volume curve analysis and further parameters. So we could have a third quality check there as well. And we could also go backwards and, and correct for motion on the far left. So basically, thinking back about the future of AI and radiology, we've been trying to break down the silos of medical imaging to so just go between uh, those different components from the scanner to, to the analysis, and hopefully right down to the, um, or right up to the radiologist. And of course, there are some people thinking now, do we actually need images? Could we not extract all that data which, we, which we're kind of processing in the pipeline directly? And of course we can do that to some degree, but I think it's also still good to do both in parallel. And I think we should think about some randomized trials which help us understand um, the, the applicability of these methods. So AI in fact is part of the future of radiology. So I'm, I'm going back to that original statement whether we should stop training radiologists now, but what Langlord, who you might be familiar with from Stanford, said actually AI won't replace radiologists, but radiologists who use AI will replace radiologists who don't. So hopefully that's something that will inspire you to, to keep working with us because we, we need each other on this really, really big challenge. I'd like to acknowledge my collaborators from King's Imperial, Queen Mary and, and Oxford. It's part of the, the work I've presented as part of our Smart Heart EPSSC program grant, where we're just thinking about round two, Smart Heart uh, version two. Um, and uh, thank you very much here. Just some, some things which, if you're interested in our work, there's lots of exciting things going on in terms of conferences and journals that we've been setting up. Thank you very much.